Shalom, my dear friends. Wow, what a most moving, inspiring Yom Kippur. So many came by the Chabad from all walks of life, from near and far, old timers, newcomers. Unbelievable, friends. I've received email and feedback from so many people. Just wanted to share with you a few highlights that personally moved me. One friend just wrote to me a letter. He said, Rabbi, thank you for the most inspirational, deeply moving high holidays, and I will cherish them and use them as pillars for the upcoming Jewish New Year. Thank you, thank you. Another newcomer shared, while Judaism is an integral part of our lives, and we're thrilled to have found a place at Chabad of Nashville to come and celebrate our heritage. The service was beautiful, was uplifting, and at times was very emotional, and we will do our best to attend shul, to come to services on Shabbat as often as we can. Thank you for a most meaningful Yom Kippur. Thank you, friends, for inspiring me what a great kickoff of the new year. Well, now we just concluded the days of awe and we enter the days of joy. In Hebrew, it's called Zman Simchatenu, the festival of Sukkot. You know, on the first day of Sukkot, we all come together, we celebrate, we shake the lulav and etrog, we go in the sukkah, and we read from the Torah, from the book of Leviticus, a portion that enumerates all the festivals and it begins with detailing the Passover holiday all the way throughout the Jewish calendar, goes through all the holidays, and it concludes with the final verses about the festival that's about to begin, Sukkot. And it says like this, And you shall take for yourself on the first day the fruit of the Hadar tree, date palm and a, a, a branch of a date palm tree, and a myrtle and the willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in a seven-day period, basically to take the four species. Now, when you look at the verse, it seems quite puzzling. What does it mean when it says, on the first day you shall take? Because after all, the verse concludes that we are to rejoice for a seven-day period. And we all know that we're about, we're about to eat way too much food and sit outside in the sukkah for an entire week. Well, so what does it mean that, we're, that we are to take the lulav, the four species, and shake them together on the first day only? That's what it sounds like. So the Midrash actually offers a beautiful take on this. It says the first day doesn't mean the first day of the holiday in a purely technical sense. Rather, it's a reference to the fact that the first day of Sukkot is the first day that we account for sins. What does that mean? So the Midrash explains that we're now coming just after four days ago was Yom Kippur, a day that every person prayed and their slate was cleared before God the Creator. So there's really very little time to make you do any sins between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, just a few days. And what's more, with all the hectic holiday preparations, we're building the sukkah, we're getting the lulav, the yetro, putting it all together. There's so much to do, you know, and then you have to cook the brisket and the food and so many meals to prepare for and, and make the sukkah look beautiful that you really got to be creative to find ways to do a sin in these few days since Yom Kippur. But once sukkot comes and the dust finally settles, and you know, and you know, the, the last brisket, pieces of briskets are, you know, are consumed, you know, you go into the holiday, you really... Uh, now you get like a chance to commit a sin. So now when it says that the Sukkot, first day Sukkot is the first day of counting your sins, it's on this day that God's like starts running the meter on your actions until next Yom Kippur. It's a nice midrash. Some Polish Hasidic rabbis taught an, an, an interesting allusion to this phenomena. It says in Hebrew, every letter has a numerical value. The numerical value of the word Satan, Satan, is 359. It's exactly six less than 365, the number of the days in the year. So they say it alludes to the fact that the Satan takes like a six-day six vacation, you know, when your kipper comes until after until the first few days of Sukkot. You know, he took a little vacation. Now that Sukkot is underway, ah, now we can start working. Friends, this is all nice and you know quite interesting, but it's a bit bizarre. I mean, why would the first day Sukkot really be a time to think about sin? I mean, it's just a bit petty and criminal-minded calculations that we reduce the beautiful day that we enter the divine grace in the sukkah here, you know, why are we even talking about sin on this special holy day? The sukkah is a hug from God. Why connect that the first day sukkot is to atone for sins? So Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Arditchev, a very holy man, he shared a beautiful idea that explains this bizarre rendering. And you know, in some of the Chabad Rebbe's would often quote this. And uh, the famous, there was a famous Hasidic um, holy person, his name was Rabbi Yoel Khan. And he said the Rebbe was particularly fond of this idea. What is it? It goes like this. At the first day, accounting of sin means that Sukkot is the first day when we're finally 
able to bring our sins into account. In other words, until this day, we were afraid of sin. We were ashamed of our past and seeking to put it behind us. But on Sukkot, now we matured, we matured to a level at which we're able to embrace our past mistakes and render them a net positive on our religious strife. See, friends, that's the beautiful thing about tshuva, about true repentance, a real proper return that is actually fueled by love, not by fear. It's able to actually transform the past sin, a troubled history, into something positive. Like the famous sage in the Talmud, Rishlakish, who he himself was a bandit, a troublemaker, and he became a Talmudic sage. He famously declared, great is teshuva, that it has transformed sin into merit. Because at the beginning of his or her journey, what happens, or any person, a Jewish person or anyone in a relationship with God approaches God on the New Year Rosh Hashanah. And then following that with Yom Kippur, trepidation, you're serious, you're praying, and it's not just a small dollop of fear and you express remorse or regret and you resolve to do tshuva in the future. That's beautiful. But when Sukkot arrives and your eyes are shining and you're so uplifted and your heart is bursting with love to the Creator, a Jew goes about choosing the nicest type of esrog. And he sweats as he puts up the sukkah and he makes it so beautifully. It's, it's, you know, it's not such a simple thing. You got to run from Home Depot to Lowe's. You got to make it beautiful. And, but he's so happy to do it. Because the joy of Sukkot is a joy of being close with God. The teshuva, the repentance is shining with joy and love. This joy, this simcha, this love, this transforms all your past sins and mistakes into something just as beautiful. This Sukkot is truly the first day of Sukkot is when we can actually talk about sin. Because now we're able to transform, embrace the sin and transform the sin. Now when this idea was presented to the famous Baba Sali, Rabbi Yisrael Abu Chatzera, he even added an, under, an other wonderful layer of depth to this. He said something so beautiful. He said it is customary to visit a water on Rosh Hashanah, to cast away our sins. It's called Tashlech. We go to the water, say a prayer, cast your sins into the sea. He said, now the curious thing is that just days, okay, a few weeks later on Sukkot, we celebrate Simchat Betasheva, which means in biblical days, it was called the festival of the water drawing. In the Holy Temple, the Jewish people of Jerusalem would draw water from a nearby stream and pour it over the altar. And it made a, triggered a great big cele celebration that was over the top. I mean, people, the rabbis would juggle eggs and fire. It was unbelievable. It actually says, whoever didn't see the joy of the drawing of the water never saw true joy in their life. Uh, whoa, whoa, that, that doesn't make sense. We just cast all our sins in the water on Rosh Hashanah. Why do we want to go ahead and pour out this water over the altar? And while we're asking questions, why do we choose water as the means of disposal? I mean, wouldn't be fire be a better means of like sin waste management, getting rid of them entirely? Why throw your sins into water? The Baba Sali answers something so beautiful, so sweet. He says, we're not looking to completely get rid of our sins. Rather, we're casting them in the water on Rosh Hashanah. And finally on Sukkot, we actually go and we retrieve the sins. We transform them. With our tshuva, our repentance of true love, you can go back and redeem those challenging moments that are waiting in the water. So how does it work? That the high rhetoric of transforming the past sounds good. But how does it work? How do you actually do it? I mean, after all, the past is the past. And if there's one thing you can't change, it's history. It happened already. It's objective truth. I mean, how could you just magically go back in time and render your mistakes a net positive? I mean, it's not as if we're granted time machines over the high holidays. So what's really the idea here? Friends, speak to the guy. Think, think of it. Imagine, speak to someone who was texting while driving and God forbid ended up in a, causing a terrible, maybe even a fatal accident. He would love the chance to fix the past, to take back that moment and just go back to what happened a few minutes before and things would be different. There would be no loss. But as much as he would want it, he can't. Because when the deed is done, God forbid lives are lost and he's left with no other option than to feel terrible for the rest of his life. So what does it mean to change the past? So in a remarkable, uplifting talk from the Rebbe, he shares with us a life-changing idea, a beautiful gift. He says, 
what a proper loving tshuva does, repentance does, is not some magical time machine trick. Rather, it actually gives us a new perspective on the past. From the vantage point of a loving teshuva, we could look at the past, at those low moments of mistake and sin, and recognize that they were painful steps on a journey forward, upward. Because the loving teshuva of Sukkot is, comes because it's a direct result of the tears, of the chest beating, of the achit on the high holidays. At those hard, trending moments, of when we heard the shofar and the gates were wide open during the Elah, when we cried bitter tears of remorse, during those very moments, the joy, love, and embrace of Sukkot was born. This is the secret of life. You cannot climb higher without first falling on your face. There's no love without distance, no discovery without loss. And while everyone is looking for creative ways to scrub their resumes, God tells us it's unnecessary. It's even counterproductive. Don't erase. Just build. God whispers in our ear. Be better. Do better. Be someone and do something you would have never done if you wouldn't have fallen so low. And when you do, looking back, you can truly say, that wasn't just a fall. It was a stepping stone to my current climb. Let me tell you a story. You know that cereal cornflakes we all eat? You know how it came to be? Dr. Har Harvey K Kellogg's was one of America's first wellness gurus, and he helped make a movement of a cleaner living in the late 1800s. He actually took over a health institute in Battle Creek, Michigan, and he built into a famous world medical spa and resort known as the Battle Creek Sanatorium. Listen to what happened. He, he built this sanatorium, this health place, wellness on principles like eating a vegetarian diet, avoiding alcohol and tobacco, not having much caffeine. And Dr. Kellogg's philosophy of biological living emphasized regular exercise, massage therapy, drinking a lot of water. This goes back to the late 1800s. And according to the company history, it was one night in the year 1898 when a batch of wheat-based cereal, though, by mistake, they left it out for an extended period of time, and it, what happened was the wheat fermented. So when they rolled out into thin sheets, the slightly moldy dough, it made actually perfect large thin flakes that became crispy and tasty in the oven. And over the next few years, Dr. Kellogg's kept experimenting with this recipe and figured out that actually corn rather than wheat actually produced even crunchier, crispier flakes. And the patients at this sanatorium this wellness center, loved the new cereal flakes. And Dr. Kellogg saw an opportunity to market the flakes to ordinary people who wanted a light, healthy breakfast. And he, you know, he added a little malt and sugar. What is it? I mean, nothing goes without sugar, right? A little salt to the dough. And you know what happened? He began manufacturing Kellogg's cornflakes in mass quantities and pouring much of the profits into advertising. And by 1909, this company was putting out 120,000 cases of cornflakes a day. Look at that, friends. One mistake, one act of a culinary flippancy turned into something remarkable. Take a look at this other story. In Brooklyn, New York, there's a neighborhood called Borough Park. And there's a synagogue there called Shomri Shabbat that literally has a minyan, that means services, like a minyan factory, meaning to say that the entire day and night, that place is constantly hustling and bustling with life. That means you want a minion at two in the afternoon or at two in the morning, there's always services. It's a 24 hour, people going there and praying. It's called Shomri Shabbat. They always have tea and coffee and it's 24 seven. You can come make a hot drink, 24 seven. You can find a place of a minion with a service and it's a comfortable, beautiful place to go. That's a unique thing. I don't know of any other synagogue in the world that you can say 24 seven. Even the Western Wall gets quiet at 3, 4 a.m. Maybe it has a minion. The story is there was once a young man from that neighborhood who was on a date with a young woman. And he realized that it was getting late. And he had to do the afternoon service before sunset called a mincha. So what he did was, he said to this woman, give me a few minutes. He went off to the side and he quickly did his religious duties. And the young lady he was dating was unimpressed with this flippancy of just walking away from a date and, you know, going to pray. She called off the courtship. This young man... He took the experience to heart and he decided then and there that one day, if he makes it in life, he'll do well, 
he's going to build a big, beautiful shul, synagogue, that's always going to have a minyan. And it's always going to be coffee and tea and hot drinks for anyone that goes to make it a comfortable experience. So someone can always have a place to pray and not have to go off on the side of the road. Years later, he was an elderly man and he heard that this woman that he dated many years ago passed away. As the casket passed by the neighborhood synagogue called Shomri Hadash, he ran out and exclaimed. He said to this woman who passed away, you see this shul, you see this building here, 24-7 synagogue, it's all in your merit. You see, friends, one mistake, one act of religious flippancy turned into something remarkable. You see, friends, we just had Yom Kippur, and we said the prayer of Ravinu Malkinu. We said it throughout the whole high holidays, and when we request our Father, our King, write us in the book of merit. You ever think about it? It's an interesting request. I mean, who gets into the Book of Merit? If you have a good behavior, you do well. It's based on how you, a person does. If you don't do well, you do, what does it mean? How could you say, write me in the Book of Merit? I mean, if you deserve it, you'll get in there. I mean, are we looking, trying to cheat the system, saying, God, you know, uh, sneak us into that good book because we asked you so nicely? I mean, God, give me the lollipop because I asked like such a nice little boy or girl. I'm doing so well. I mean, is that what it takes? Or is it book of merit means based on your merit? You get into the book of merit. I mean, imagine someone shows up in a court without a lawyer and he tells the judge, eh, sir, let's not waste our time. Just give me an innocent verdict and uh, let's all go back home. I mean, friends, that doesn't go. So what exactly does it mean when we say, Avinu malkeinu kasveinu besefer zechui is God, our father, our king, write me in the book of merit, in a good book of good things. So it says in Hasidus, we're really requesting, God, grant me the wisdom to understand that my sins really belong to the Book of Merit. Give me the courage to take a deep breath after messing up and to take the opportunity to utilize that mistake for something good to make me better. Give me the strength of character to write this script in such a way that the low points are just another chapter in the book of my merits. Please make me one who does tshuva repentance that transforms sins into merit. And our Rebbe famously championed this approach. A certain lady once wrote a letter to the Rebbe with a concern. She says, she was not, not, now she wasn't religious. I mean, she was now became religious, but her children that was born before she became religious, she was worried that maybe they were conceived to parents who didn't keep the laws of family purity. So while she had done, she did tshuva, she became, she left her past and she became more of a traditional observant Jewish woman. What should she do for her with her children that were already living, breathing human beings that were maybe born in sin? And the Rebbe, with his wisdom, he said that one sin never to lead to another sin. So depression and a heavy heart was not the answer to such thoughts. The Rebbe said, our Torah tells us that there's nothing that cannot be repaired. And so, add something positive. If you're concerned about family purity, then channel that energy into encouraging others in doing so. Your challenge can be turned into a stepping stone to inspire others to do what you couldn't do. A friends, just a few weeks ago, Hanan Mendel got married. Many of you have been at the wedding. Many of you have seen pictures or videos. You remember what happened at the end of the chuppah? Mendel took his foot and he stamped on the glass and he broke it. And why did we break a glass by the chuppah? We say so we should never forget that the, as we mourn for the destruction of the holy temple. But friends, if you think about it, if you ever go to a Jewish wedding, I mean, it's the sound of breaking glass, immediately what happens after that? Everybody else, everyone shouts, Mazel Tov! And the symphony strikes a very round, joyous song of Oji Shama and everyone's hugging and kissing and they're so happy. Why are we yelling Mazel Tov if we just broke something to remember the destruction of the early temple, a sign of mourning? That seems a bit of an oxymoron. But friends, that's the whole point. Breaking something, a moment of mourning, doesn't need to lead to tears and to chest beating. Standing under the chuppah, this new couple and any new couple Learn this important lesson, that in life, things will break. Yes, they will. There's going to be moments of grief, moments of challenge, moments of struggle, and moments of strife. But does no matter. Don't get caught into a loop of depression. 
Because remember, that brokenness will lead to a subsequent wholesomeness previously unmatched. So friends, go ahead, break things, smash the glass, and instead of crying, lift your eyes to heaven and shout, Mazel Tov! Friends, I want to wish you from my heart a most joyous and happy Sukkot. Go into the Sukkah. Feel the embrace of Almighty God. Take all of the inspiration and everything you experienced over the high holidays. Internalize it. May this be the springboard to spring off into a most amazing year, starting with the holiday of Sukkot this weekend. And may it be that we experience the joy that they experienced in the Holy Temple. True inner joy. Raise your glass to Allah Chaim. Go into the sukkah. Feel the embrace of the Almighty God on this sukkot. And may it be a true Zman Simchasenu, a holiday of joy and happiness spiritually and materially. I wish you on behalf of Esther and I and our whole Chabad of national community a most joyous and happy holiday of Sukkot and Simchat Torah. L'chaim and Gut Yamtif.